I'd now like to shift our attention to how to use specific aspects of muscular contraction to improve muscle hypertrophy, muscle growth, as well as improving muscle strength. There are a lot of reasons to want to get stronger. And I should just mention that it's not always the case that getting stronger involves muscles getting bigger. There are ways for muscles to get stronger without getting bigger. However, increasing the size of a muscle almost inevitably increases the strength of that muscle, at least to some degree. Reasons why most everyone should want to get their muscles stronger is that muscles are generally getting progressively weaker across the lifespan. So when I say getting stronger, it's not necessarily about being able to move increasing amounts of weight in the gym, but rather to offset some of the normal decline in strength and posture and the ability to generate a large range of movement safely that occurs as we age. So there's an important principle of muscle physiology called the Henneman size principle. And the Henneman size principle essentially says that we recruit what are called motor units. Motor units are just the connections between nerve and muscle from a, in a pattern that staircases from low threshold to high threshold. What this means is when you pick up something that is light, you're going to use the minimum amount of nerve to muscle energy in order to move that thing. Likewise, when you pick up an object that's heavy, you're going to use the minimum amount of nerve to muscle connectivity and energy in order to move that object. So it's basically a conservation of energy principle. Now, if you continue to exert effort of movement, what will happen is you will tend to recruit more and more motor units with time. As you recruit more and more of these motor units, these connections between these lower motor neurons and muscle, that's when you start to get changes in the muscle. That's when you open the gate for the potential for the muscles to get stronger and to get larger. And so the way this process works has been badly misunderstood in the kind of online literature of weight training and bodybuilding and even in sports physiology. The Henneman size principle is kind of a, a, a foundational principle within muscle physiology. But many people have come to interpret it by saying that the way to recruit high threshold motor units, the ones that are hard to get to, is to just use heavy weights. And that's actually not the case. As we'll talk about, the research supports that weights in a very large range of sort of a percentage of your maximum, anywhere from 30 to 80%, so weights that are not very light but are moderately light, too heavy, can cause changes in the connections between nerve and muscle that lead to muscle strength and muscle hypertrophy. Put differently, heavy weights can help build muscle and strength, but they are not required. What one has to do is adhere to a certain number of parameters, just a couple of key variables that I'll spell out for you. And if you do that, you can greatly increase muscle hypertrophy, muscle size, and or muscle strength if that's what you want to do. And you don't necessarily have to use heavy weights in order to do that. Now, I'm sure the power lifters and the, the people that like to move heavy weights around will say, no, if you want to get strong, you absolutely have to lift heavy weights. And that might be true if you want to get very strong. But for most people who are interested in supporting their muscular such that they offset any age-related decline in strength or in increasing hypertrophy and, and strength to some degree, there really isn't a need to use the heaviest weights possible in order to build strength and muscle. So there are three major stimuli for changing the way that muscle works and making muscles stronger, larger, or better in some way. And those are stress, tension, and damage. Those three things don't necessarily all have to be present, but stress of some kind has to exist. So this is very reminiscent of neuroplasticity in the brain. There is a good predictor of how well or how efficient you will be in building the strength and or, if you like, the size of a given muscle. And it has everything to do with those upper motor neurons that are involved in deliberate control of muscle. You can actually do this test right now. You can just kind of march across your body mentally and see whether or not you can independently contract any or all of your muscles. Because everything about muscle hypertrophy 
about stimulating muscle growth is about generating isolated contractions, about challenging specific muscles in a very unnatural way. If you, whereas with strength, it's about using musculature as a system, moving weights, moving resistance, moving the body. The specific goal of hypertrophy is to isolate specific nerve to muscle pathways so that you stimulate the chemical and signaling transduction events in muscles so that those muscles respond by getting larger. So there's a critical distinction in terms of getting stronger versus trying to get muscles to be larger, hypertrophy per se, and it has to do with how much you isolate those muscles. So you can nest this as a principle for yourself, which is if you want to get stronger, it's really about moving progressively greater loads or increasing the amount of weight that you move. Whereas if you're specifically interested in generating hypertrophy, it's all about trying to generate those really hard, almost painful localized contractions of muscle. If ever there was an area of practical science that was very confused, very controversial and almost combative at times, it would be this issue of how best to train. I suppose the only thing that's um, even more barbed wire of a conversation than that is how best to eat for health. Those seem to be the the uh, two most common areas of, of online battle. What's very clear now from all the literature is that once you know roughly your one repetition maximum, the the maximum amount of weight that you can perform an exercise with for one repetition in good form, full, full range of motion, that it's very clear that moving weights or using bands or using body weight, for instance, in the 30 to 80% of one rep maximum, that is going to be the most beneficial range in terms of muscle hypertrophy and strength. So muscle growth and strength. So let's say you're somebody who's been doing some resistance exercise kind of on and off over the years and you decide you want to get serious about that for sake of sport or offsetting age-related declines in strength, the range of sets to do in order to improve strength ranges anywhere from two, believe it or not, to 20 per week. Again, these are sets per week, and they don't necessarily all have to be performed in the same weight training session. It appears that five sets per week in this 30% to 80% of the one repetition maximum range is what's required just to maintain your muscle. So think about that. If you're somebody who's kind of averse to resistance training, you are going to lose muscle size and strength. Your metabolism will drop. Your posture will get worse. Everything in the, in the context of nerve to muscle connectivity will get worse over time unless you are generating five sets or more of this 30% to 80% of your one repetition maximum per week, okay? So what this means is for the typical person who hasn't done a lot of weight training, you need to do at least five sets per muscle group. Now, that's just to maintain. And then there's this huge range that goes all the way up to 15 and in some case, 20 sets per week. Now, how many sets you perform is going to depend on the intensity of the work that you perform. This is where it gets a little bit controversial, but I think nowadays most people agree that 10% of the sets of a given uh, workout or 10% of workouts overall should be of the high intensity sort where one is actually working to muscular failure. But the point being that most of your training, most of your sets should be not to failure. And the reason for that is it allows you to do more volume of work. So we can make this simple. Perform anywhere from 5 to 15 sets of resistance exercise per week. And that's per muscle. And that's in this 30 to 80% of what your one repetition maximum. That seems to be the, the most scientifically supported way of offsetting any decline in muscle strength. If you're working in the kind of 5 set range. And in increasing muscle strength when you start to get up into the 10 and 15 set range. But it's pretty clear that performing this five to 15 sets per week, whether or not it's in one workout or whether or not it's divided up across multiple workouts is really what's gonna be most beneficial. And please do keep in mind Henneman's uh, size principle and the recruitment of motor units. And remember, the better you are at contracting particular muscles and in isolating those muscles, the fewer sets likely you need to do in order to get the desired effect. What about people who have been training for a while? If you're somebody who's been doing weight training for a while 
the data point to the fact that more volume can be beneficial, even for muscles that you are very efficient at contracting. Now, the, the curve on this, the graph on this, begins again at about five sets per week for maintaining a given muscle group and extends all the way out to 25 or 30 sets per week. However, there are individuals who, for whatever reason, can generate so much force. They're so good at training muscles that they can generate so much force in just four or six or eight sets that doing this large volume of work is actually going to be counterproductive. So everyone needs to figure out for themselves, first of all, how often you're willing to do resistance exercise of any kind. And then it does appear that somewhere between five and 15 sets per week is going to be what's the thing that's going to work for most people. Now, this is based on a tremendous amount of work that was done by Andy Galpin and colleagues, Brad Schoenfield and colleagues, Mike Roberts. There's a huge group of people out there doing exercise physiology and a small subset of them that are linking them back to real world protocols that don't just pertain to athletes. So that's mainly what I'm focusing on today. And surely there will be exceptions. Now, if you are going to divide the sets across the week, you're not going to do all 10 sets, for instance, for a given muscle group in one session, then of course, it's imperative that the muscles recover in between sessions. You might ask, well, what about the speeds of movements? This is actually turns out to be a really interesting data set for generating explosiveness and speed. It's very clear that learning to generate forces quickly and to move heavy or moderately heavy loads quickly is going to be beneficial because of the way that you train the motor neurons. And of course, changes in the muscle. And so what this would involve is something like 60 to 75% of a one repetition maximum. And then in a controlled way, moving that as quickly as one can throughout the entire set and certainly not going to failure because as you approach failure, the inability to move the weight with good form, the weight inevitably slows down. So as you're probably starting to realize, you need to customize a resistance practice for your particular needs and goals. So we've talked about a few principles, the fact that you need to get sufficient volume, you need at least five sets to maintain, and you probably need about 10 sets per muscle group in order to improve muscle, that moving weights of moderate to uh, moderately heavy weight quickly is going to be best for explosiveness, that isolating muscles and really contracting muscles hard, something that you can test by just when you're outside the training session, seeing whether or not you can cramp the muscle hard will really, uh, will tell you your capacity to improve hypertrophy or to engage strength changes in that muscle. That your ability to contract a muscle hard is inversely related to the number of sets that you should do in order to isolate and stimulate that muscle. Now, how long to recover between sets is a question for the testosterone protocol. Duncan French and colleagues found that it was about two minutes, keeping that really on the clock, two minutes, not longer. For hypertrophy and for strength gains, it does seem that resting anywhere from two minutes or even three or four or even five or six minutes can be beneficial. 